you enjoyed your break on this beautiful spring, late spring morning. Into, we're going to have a, a very slight change to the, um, to, to the, to the schedule now uh, because Barry Gardner has to leave. Uh, so what we're going to do is ask him... Where are you, Barry? Are you here? Oh, he's popped out. He's popped out. Uh, he'll be back in just a second. Um, we'll ask Barry to, um, to sum up as much as he can for a couple of minutes before he goes, and then we're going to hear Christine, who I understand is, is quite a sort of forthright speaker, so that should be fun. <laughs> Your reputation, Christine. Um, whilst we're waiting for Barry to come back, why don't we take one quick, concise question from Duncan over, over here? To Bashir. Uh, just shout it. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Duncan Clark, the editor of Asian Affairs magazine. You were talking, the, you said a very interesting phrase. You said the Americans like to talk to the people who make the decisions. And then you said that's why they're involved in the discussions with the Afghan and with the um, Taliban. Um, yeah, that's right. I'm also thinking about where Pakistan fits into this picture. Because the Pakistan experts that we've been talking to say that the civilian government of Imran Khan is really ceded power already to the military establishment. So in terms of the peace negotiations regarding Afghanistan, what's the involvement of Pakistan? Well, what the, what the Pakistani government is saying, I, I, we have interviewed, for example, I was just talking to somebody here. Uh, the last the ex-foreign uh, minister, Khwaja Asif, I was talking to, and he said that, uh, uh, he confirmed that they have clear influence on the Taliban, uh, but he said we are using this for peace process and for peaceful meetings. Uh, th th that's, I mean, like, you can question th that, and I question him, uh, but uh, w what's happening in those negotiations, the, the Taliban and the Americans are saying that this is the initial stage of the talks, and when it grows further, and then we will involve other uh, regional countries. On the other hand, uh, the Pakistani government is saying that they have facilitated these talks, so they are already involved in these talks. So, so you, you can say that, you know, Taliban are uh, coming to these negotiation uh, tables uh, already, uh, we presume that they have already discussed these things with the Pakistani officials because the Pakistani officials are saying that we have given the, you know, affirmative to these Taliban to go and talk to them and we, they are saying that we have brought them to the table. So that means if they have brought them, they already, uh, the representation is already there. Uh, I don't want to use the word that the Taliban are representing Pakistan or Pakistan is representing uh, 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 Taliban, because I'm a journalist, I have to be balanced, but that's what are they saying. You can drive your own conclusion from this, but that, that's what happened. Tal Pakistan is already involved in there. Uh, thank you, Bashir. We're now going to, Barry has returned. So um, I'm going to hand you the microphone, Barry, to give us your uh, upsum so far of what's happened. Humphrey, thanks very much. Um, first of all, my apologies, particularly to Christine, um, who, whose speech I had very much been looking forward to. Um, and unfortunately, I, I do have to, uh, to leave promptly at five. Um, I, I have a confession to make. I have understood probably less than a tenth of what people are saying. Um, you have made the problems I've been dealing with on Brexit sound very, very simple indeed. Um, you have shown us that actually in Parliament we are a model of reasonable and rational behavior. <laughs> and let, let me just try and, and you know the story about, about the judge and the barrister. Um, the barrister is explaining at great length the innocence of his client. 
And at the end of it all, this peroration, the, 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 the judge turns around and says, Mr. Clark, you have expatiated at great length, but I'm none the wiser. Uh, to which the barrister, Mr. Clark, responded, none the wiser, my lad, but much better informed. Um, <laughs> And, and I feel, in, in a sense, I'm in that position. Um, I want to read you a poem. It's called Surgery Note One. His eight-year-old granddaughter translates his torrent of angry words. The senior Afghan card officer, surrounded now by women whose help he needs. His hands shake with agitation as he stares through the pattern of words, intricate as a cedarwood screen. That officer, it's not my poem, by the way. <laughs> um, that officer, though, came into my immigration visa and asylum surgery. And what you were saying, Bashir, about the difficulty of being a male in that cultural context, translated here to this man who depended on his granddaughter to come and explain to me what his immigration needs were. Um, you've, you've set out uh, a tremendous analysis over the course of this afternoon, the, the speakers, um, that really has told us, scratch history and you find geography. Scratch history and you find geography. Geography undergirds it all, and, and from the earlier sessions, um, Pakistan is obsessed with India. Your words, not mine. And should pay more attention to Iran. Pakistan's instability to spill over into Iran. These are the, the, the ideas that were coming through here about the nature of geography and the the way in which your neighbors have such a profound influence on you. Um, how do you fight insurgency? Not with insurgency. How do you fight insurgency? Um, one of the, the phrases that I circled was, a rich army but a poor nation, a rich army, but a poor nation. And you have to say, why? Why should the guardians of poverty be so rich? And this idea that the talks with the Taliban exclude the Afghan government because in, I suppose in, in common idiom, we would say in English, one wants to speak not with the monkey but the organ grinder, I think is the phrase. You speak with the person who's actually calling the shots. Um, and there's this element of appearance and reality. What appearance and reality, and the threat of ISIS waiting in the wings. Um, what, what, I, what I think I haven't heard today, I've heard lots of analysis. It's the solutions that we're lacking. And I know that the focus of, I think, some of the analysis has been on 
the sources of funding and the need to cut those sources of funding from those who are perpetuating the, the terrorism. Um, and of course, the sort of opposite or the, the, the counterpoint to that would appear to be that what one must do is, is take the funding away from there, but ensure that the, the cause of frustration, seriously, when I say, I really feel I have not understood 90% of what people have been talking about. So I'm speaking as someone coming to this fresh. You're speaking as many of you people who, for whom this is lifelong. But then you have to understand that I represent most of the people looking at this situation. You have to bear with the sort of ignorance that I represent and understand how it looks from the outside. But the final thing, I, as I say, I would want to, to put into to the conversation is really about the politics of identity. And one of the things, actually, Humphrey, you very kind remarks about last night, but actually, rather than the, the sort of Brexit put down on, 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 on the lady to my left, the most important thing that I wanted to communicate last night was about how we are so obsessed with our identity politics, whether it's a clan or a tribe or a grouping, um, whether it's an ethnicity or a religion or a sexual orientation, that our obsession with our rights has, and, and asserting who we are, it seems to me, has got a priority over any sense of wider duties and obligations that we may have. And these are the very things that are destroying democratic debate and the possibility of pluralist society. And by pluralist, I, 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 you know, I'm not just talking about places like the UK or Europe, Western Europe. Um, I mean any society where there are groups that have deeply held differences of what a good life consists of. And the trouble is we, we all have a different conception of what is a good life to lead, what is a virtuous life to lead. And if we're to live together, we have to be able to come into the public domain, the public institutions and find our sense of our self-worth and our identity respected, reinforced. But so often when we do, we actually find that we're repulsed from those institutions because we come up against people who have radically different conceptions of a good life and who reject our version of it. And, and how we overcome that is the fundamental problem. But it's not a problem simply of politics. It's not a problem simply of economics and money. It's a problem of identity at its core. Um, and with that, I'm now seven minutes late for leaving, um, and I must depart. But thank you so much. I, I am none the wiser, but much better informed. <laughs>
something happens, but uh, you've got a good you know, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll do the Q&A, and then if people need to leave, just, just get up and go, and good luck. All right. I have to say, you all have uh, a lot of patience. Hopefully this, this will come out, inshallah. So I had to, <laughs> maybe I should thank that fellow for pulling the alarm, because um, actually Taha Siddiqui said a lot of the things that I would have ordinarily have said. So I had to reorganize some of my thoughts kind of on the move. If I had expected that, um, Taha and I, we, we should have divided and conquered. So I'm going to take this perhaps from a more academic point of, uh, an academic structure. Um, which is basically a different way of reframing the things that Taha has already said, but put it in a different kind of lexicon from the point of view of how a policymaker has traditionally seen the Pakistan puzzle. And of course, specifically, I'm talking about an American uh, policymaking perspective. So I think there is a general understanding amongst South Asia experts in the United States that Pakistan is the revisionist power, right? That uh, even though people will talk about an India-Pakistan dispute, most people who are knowledgeable know that this is really Pakistan's dispute with India. And that largely, Pakistan is obsessed with obtaining territory to which it was never entitled. And I can make uh, various uh, arguments in defense of that statement, but I think the easiest thing to do is go to the Indian Independence Act of 1947, where it makes it very clear that Pakistan was never entitled to Kashmir. We can also uh, go to the fact that Mahara the Maharaja of Kashmir had signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan, which meant that Pakistan was not to invade, but yet it did in 47 and 48. All right, so the the issue is not a lack of understanding amongst experts. The problem is that many people who are in charge of the Pakistan uh, billet in the United States are not experts, right? So this is what I'll call the liability of newness. You'll have people moving into the Pakistan desk. The previous posting was Peru. By the time they might get an inkling of how Pakistan operates, they're already moving to their next post. So this creates a lot of opportunities for Pakistan to exploit these asymmetries of information. And I, I think the event that we witnessed today, but the same individual was involved in, in previous disruptions, certainly when I've been here, and I understand that he's done so before, is actually part of a pattern, right? If you were to come to think tank talks in DC, you will see the same thing. When uh, we give talks uh, on Pakistan at KCL, uh, KCL here in London, uh, where the double I, double S, Rusi, you will see the same thing. And their agenda is, is very typically to try to destabilize things that actual experts know to be facts, right? For example, Pakistan did not start these wars. Somehow India deserved to be uh, um, attacked by Pakistani proxies by virtue of other behaviors that, that it has done within its own sovereign borders. So one of the problems, I think, for policymakers and why solutions are so difficult to grasp is that we don't, at least in the United States, and I suspect that the UK might be different, we do not incentivize South Asia experts in these various bureaucratic lenses, right? And so this, when, when Pakistanis come to town, they are at an informational advantage. And typically, the bureaucrats will be a little bit more senior to the Americans. And they are able to present a compelling alternative narrative to the fact. And one of the things that they've been able to do is they've been able to create this sense 
of concatenating victimization. They'll tell a false narrative of US-Pakistan relations, which is all about how the United States used and abused poor Pakistan. And they're constantly creating this sense of uh, a debt that Americans have to pay back to Pakistan. And we see this happening time and time again. And as, the, as a particular administration starts to clue up, the administration ends. And by administration, it could be a presidential administration, it could be the tenure of a congressperson, it could be the tenure of a senator. So even though there are people who might understand the Pakistan problem and who might have some inklings of what we should do about it, they either rotate out of this position of influence or there are so few of them that they actually can't create a consensus. So what we actually see over the various decades that the United States has been engaging Pakistan is a constant revisiting of the same problems, usually with the same tools. And when I'm making fun of this, I talk about the goldfish swimming around the goldfish bowl, remarking upon this new couch. But it's not a new couch. It's the same couch. It's just the goldfish has no ability to remember that this is the same couch. So one of the themes that when you talk to Americans, they have this notion that Pakistan does what it does because it is an insecure state, right? They will say, look how big India is. They will have a fictive narrative about the various wars. The narrative is always about how poor little Pakistan never got a fair shake. And if only there's some amount of money some amount of F-16s, some amount of AMRAMs, some number of attack helicopters, Pakistan will feel at safe within its borders. It will no longer feel the need to take pungas in Kashmir or take pungas in Afghanistan. Now this thinking has given rise to various uh, notions of a grand bargain, whereby if, if the peace ferry comes down and we resolve the Kashmir issue, then we will also resolve the Afghan issue. A very recent articulation of this uh, was given by Emmett Rashid and Barnett Rubin some years ago, and of course, Barnett Rubin in particular is important because he was a member of the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. The tools that Pakistan has developed to prosecute its interests are pretty straightforward. It has an army that can't win a war, it has nuclear weapons it actually cannot use. And I'm, I'm very happy to walk you through uh, the, the logic behind that assertion. So what Pakistan has developed to prosecute its interests in India and Afghanistan is using jihadis, but not always jihadis, by the way. Um, the Pakistanis also supported the Sikh insurgency. They've also supported various insurgencies in the Northeast. But what has enabled Pakistan to engage in subconventional warfare with impunity is its nuclear umbrella. So it's not a coincidence that as Pakistan's nuclear arsenal has grown in sophistication and depth, so has its ability to prosecute ever more sanguinary and horrific attacks with India, because this umbrella is what gives Pakistan this unfettered sense of impunity and immunity, right? Because what the nuclear weapons do, it raises the price of any possible Indian countermeasure. Now, this has not been without costs, right? One of the things that I think Pakistan scholars would see that's quite new in the last 15 years is that for the first time, Pakistan is countering genuine blowback from its policies in the guise of the Pakistani Taliban. Now, there are different stories about how the Pakistani Taliban came to be, um, and we might, we might debate the, the nuances and the timelines, but what we can say, and I think all of us who have different narratives, we can say this, there would be no Pakistan Taliban if there were no Afghan Taliban, if there were no Jaish -e Mohammed, if there were no Lashkar -e Jangvi. In other words, these are all actors that the state has either in the case of the Taliban and Jaish -e Mohammed explicitly groomed and nurtured to kill outside of its borders, and which it has been ambivalent about Lashkar Jangvi and Sipay Sabay Pakistan, when they kill within its borders, right? So you would think, according to political scientists, and I'm not one, for better or for worse, um, that when a state is trying to prosecute a strategy and it cannot win, 
and that the tools that it's using to prosecute that strategy imperil various aspects of the state's viability itself, we would expect that state to change its behavior. But not in the case of Pakistan. Um, any Monty Python fans? It's the Black Knight. For those of you who don't get the reference, I apologize. Google it when you see the Black Knight YouTube uh, segment. You're like, I get it. Pakistan's the Black Knight. Right. So, or if you're coming from, from my age in America, it's a weeble. It wobbles, but it doesn't fall down. And in fact, what Pakistan has done in recent years is it's not only doubled down on its geographical revisionism vis-a-vis -vis India, it has located itself as the only country to resist India's rise. Now, suffice it to say, this is also not going to succeed, right? If Pakistan could not succeed in prosecuting more minimalist goals, it's not going to be any more successful in prosecuting wider goals as the power differential between these two states continues to expand. So what explains this puzzle? In fact, this was the puzzle that motivated me to write a whole book on the Pakistan army. So this conventional wisdom that it's a security-seeking state, I argue in this book, is simply flawed that we are better off understanding Pakistan is an ideological state. That when it talks about, its, when it prosecutes its interest in Kashmir, these, these interests are not based upon security considerations. And by the way, I'm happy to talk, the, talk about the evidence for this. I reviewed 65 plus years of Pakistan military documents. They did not once mention Kashmir from the point of view of security. Most of us, we could come up with some ideas, right? Indus waters, that's kind of important. You think that might be an interest? No. When the Pakistan army talked about Kashmir, it was always about ideology. And there's a famous political scientist in the United States who, who actually nails Pakistan, although Pakistan wasn't one of his case studies, and that is that Pakistan is an ideological state or a greedy state. Well, the problem is, is that policymakers will often confuse ideological states with security seeking states. And that's when all things go very, very wrong. Because instead of buttressing the security of an insecure state, right, the misunderstanding of the problem to begin with, you are actually incentivizing the object of your policy to engage in more of the policies that you actually want to prevent in the first place. Right, so let me put this, here's, here's an example. Um, we were, until this particular individual occupying the White House uh, came to uh, run and ruin my country, we were paying Pakistan coalition support funds. And we were paying them these monies so that they would go and kill terrorists. We were not paying them to not host terrorists or to be terrorist free. Right, so this was a little bit like my mother, and I figured this out when I was a kid. Every Saturday, she paid me a lot of money to clean my room. She never paid me to keep my room clean. To this day, my husband, if he were to meet my mother, who is now deceased, he would complain about this. Because to this day, I must be incentivized to clean up my mess, right? So these are the kinds of misincentives that are created by policies that are, are foundationally rooted in a misunderstanding of the problem. So I can talk at length about some of the reasons why I think that Pakistan's revisionism is not tied to security concerns. And what I want to do, Taha already spoke about the instances that are the manifestations of these underlying concerns. But let me just try to give you a sense of what, what is behind the manifestations um, or the behaviors that, that we're witnessing. The first thing that I think it's really important to understand is this idea that what Pakistan is doing in Afghanistan is simply derivative of India is fundamentally flawed, right? The, the Pakistan-Afghanistan security competition goes back to independence when Afghanistan rejected Pakistan's admissions to the UN, but more importantly, it inherited this notion of strategic depth from the British, right? This, is, this has nothing to do with Zia. It has nothing to do with uh, subsequent army chiefs. This is continuity from what the Pakistan army learned 
when the, when when they inherited this security architecture from the British. The actually the thing that's interesting is that India also inherited this in the same way that Pakistan had a northwest frontier province which was to be a buffer between the Raj and Russia India also had the northeast frontier agency but Nehru decided he wasn't going to keep this as a buffer and he began to integrate it so the question to me is not you know why does Pakistan still have strategic depth the interesting question is why didn't India persist with strategic depth given that the security concerns were actually quite similar. So from Pakistan's point of view, it inherits the most dangerous security frontier for which the British built an entire security architecture, but with a paucity of the resources, right? And the first thing that the Afghans do is that it rejects the Durand line. In addition to which, uh, they, the, the Afghans also begin interfering in Balochistan. It doesn't take long before the 70s when, when Zulfiqar starts thinking about this. We also have evidence, um, and w w what's, what's in dispute is what provenance that these incursions enjoyed, but we also have Afghan incursions into different tribal areas uh, you know, as a part of Fatah and also parts of Balochistan. So Afghanistan presents itself as a strategic competitor to Pakistan from the beginning, and India had nothing to do with it. And remember that Ayub Khan, the first army chief himself, was a staunch uh, secularist, he was a staunch, uh, he, this by the way did not prevent him from instrumentalizing Islam, but he was himself a staunch secularist, or, and a, 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 a foe of communism. So from Ayub Khan's point of view, nothing good comes from Afghanistan. And so while we see Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto militarizing dissidents as early as 1974 when they come to Pakistan after Daud ousts Zahir Shah, we actually see Pakistan interfering in Afghanistan using Islamists as early as the late 1950s. And specifically, they're using the instrument of Jamaat Islami. Taha spoke about Jamaat Islami. Uh, being used to kill Bangladeshis, right, uh, which gave rise to the 1971, well, Bengalis then, then the, the 70 war happens, then East Pakistan becomes uh, Bangladesh. But Jamaat was also the preferred tool in Afghanistan. So you can do this really interesting thought puzzle, right? So when, when Pakistan is promoting Jamaat Islami in Afghanistan, it becomes an urban phenomenon, it becomes rooted in the University of Kabul. If there had been not this policy, there would have been no jihadis for Pakistan to sponsor from 1974 onward. Right, so what I want you to understand is that this is not reducible to Pakistan's concerns about India and the 20 mushrooming, con whatever the ridiculous number the Pakistanis are, are want to give on any given day. But this concern about Russia and Afghanistan itself becomes rapidly intertwined with India after India and Russia signed the Friendship Treaty in 1971. Right, so from that point onward, Afghanistan becomes a source of myriad threats. And from that point onward, um, in fact, a really good book to read on this is Avinash Paliwal. Um, note for female scholars, when I said this, that India was in fact running covert operations, all of the chokidars and the bucks sent me really vicious messages saying very terrible things that might or might not happen to me. But when a gentleman, half my age, Avinash Paliwal, writes a fabulous book saying the exact same thing, Kuchni Hota. By the way, I love his book. This is nothing to do about him. It's about the genderedness of science. When women make a statement, we are either pilloried for it, but then we have to have a he-splainer. So ladies, I'm gonna to suggest to you, get yourself a he-splainer. Anyway, so if, you're, if, you're, if you think that I'm uh, making inappropriate claims about India's involvement in, Kash in Afghanistan and Balochistan, please, please, please read Avinash Paliwal's book. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. So all of this is to say that Pakistan's concerns about Afghanistan are not new, they go way back. But the tools that it's used to prosecute these concerns are the same. When we turn to India, we have a similarly structural problem, right? And we can get at this if we're thinking about Pakistan's strate the strategic culture of the army, or we can get at this if we take a materialist point of view of the Pakistan army. But essentially, as, as the Pakistan army presents its history and its geography, 
It is intertwined with ideology. In fact, Yahya Khan, and before him, Ayub Khan, arrogated to the Pakistan army the duty of not only protecting Pakistan's physical territory, but also its ideology. Ayub Khan writes uh, an entire chapter on the ideological dimension in his book, Friends Not Masters, and he also wrote uh, an article on foreign affairs in the late 1950s. All, and do I really think he wrote this? Probably not. Um, but his name is on it, and it's all about the ideology of Pakistan, which is inextricably linked to the version of Islam that he wanted to promote. Curiously enough, every army chief had his own version of Islam to promote. Musharraf had his own. Um, any army chief who ran, a, who ran the country, essentially, uh, had his own version. But when you read about Kashmir in Pakistan's army journals, it's always about the two-nation theory. Now, why is that? Because Pakistan believes that partition was not complete because it did not get Kashmir. Territory, by the way, there are very few countries that wage a sustained uh, security competition with a, a similarly nuclear armed rival over territory that A, it never possessed, and two, was never entitled to possess. Right? So there is a, this is a peculiar problem that I don't, I, is a, I, I only study South Asia, but I'm not aware uh, of any situation that exists quite like this. So from Pakistan, from the point of view of the Pakistan army, which is the only point of view that frankly matters, because Imran Khan isn't even the mayor of Islamabad, uh, so he doesn't even matter in these discussions whatsoever. If they let go of Kashmir, they're essentially letting go of the two-nation theory. And if they let go of the two-nation theory, what is Pakistan? It's nothing. It's a failed version of India. Right? So I think this is why when Pakistan talks about Kashmir, it's never within security frameworks. It's always within ideology. They'll say we were entitled to it through the two-nation theory. These arguments become intrinsically interlinked. Now, this is, this is a cultural argument, which I have derived based upon a perusal of, not a perusal, all these gray hairs is from reading 65 years of this stuff. But we also come at the same position from a materialist point of view, right? And materialist point of view is this. If there were to be peace with India, how does the Pakistan army justify running and ruining the country? People would begin to say, they begin to ask some questions, why do we need this large standing army that gobbles up so much of our resources when we don't actually have an existential threat on the border, right? So this means a couple of things. It means that the Pakistan army is never going to let peace happen. And if you were to think about this just for a minute, whenever India and Pakistan have, have seriously come close to some kind of rapprochement, something bad happens. The Lahore Declaration is probably the most prominent one, and what did the army do to tank it? It launched Cargill. But here's something else to think about. Everyone that says, oh, you know, India should talk to Pakistan. I don't think that. India should not talk to Pakistan at all. And I say this not because I'm a hawk, although some of you might think I am. It's because every time Modi walks down, you know, some mahala with matching vests with his Pakistani counterpart, and they're reminiscing about something that they don't really care about, within two weeks there is a major terrorist attack in India. You can set your watch to it. So not only are these talks unproductive, they also impose opportunity costs because India could be spending that diplomatic capital uh, on other bilateral relationships that might be more fruitful and have a potential to resolve things that are resolvable, but they actually cause Indians to die. Right? So I think I've got, what, three more minutes? One more minute. Oh, done, done. So, so here's basically our conundrum, right? Pakistan has a big problem. It remains committed to revisionism, and we can come at this either from a cultural argument or from a materialist argument, right? But it can't change maps with its army. It can start wars, but it can't win them. It has nuclear weapons it can't use. Its only tool is jihadists or other non-state actors, or terrorists, whatever your preferred nomenclature is, under its nuclear umbrella. India has a problem, and I'm happy to talk about Pawama and the Bukvas over Balakot, because nothing has materially changed. India is unable 
to defeat the Pakistan army in the terms of a short-term war. Short-term war is necessary because of nuclear weapons. Long-term wars become very risky, become very dangerous. The possibility of things seriously going to a um, jehanum in a handbasket increase dramatically, right? The international community has a problem because we don't even agree amongst ourselves whether Pakistan is or is not more dangerous than Iran. I would argue that it is, right? And there are certain actors like the person occupying the White House in Washington who thinks that Iran is more dangerous than Pakistan. Although by every measure of danger, Iran only aspires to be a Pakistan, right? Then we have the British who, from my point of view, appeases the Pakistani state because you're very happy to have ISI inform uh, the British government when British nationals go abroad and are very tolerant of, of this behavior. And then we have institutions like the EU that don't matter to Pakistan at all. And then we have other countries like China in Saudi Barbaria, because I'm sorry, you kill people with bone saws, you get that name, they should change the sword on their flag with a bone saw. And not only do they not agree that Pakistan is a problem, they have their own interest that undermines the behaviors and interests of those who, who do. So this is not to say I know what the solution is, but I can tell you what's not the solution is to continue to indulge this country as if it's a security-seeking state. We need to treat it as it is, which is an ideological-seeking state. And once you understand that, you realize that there is no solution to Pakistan's behavior other than containing it. Right? And we can, have a, I, I, we can have a very fruitful discussion about what containment means. But I will wrap up in this sentence. When the Soviet Union failed, all of the bad things that nuclear proliferation pessimists feared did not happen. And the reason is, we didn't, just because the problem set was hard, we didn't run away from it. Capitals all around the world plan for the event of what happens when the Soviet Union fails, what happens to those nuclear weapons in Kazakhstan. And we had policy instruments. So I'm gonna end this, this conversation by saying we should not be afraid when Pakistan says, I'm too dangerous to fail. In fact, we should be planning for the day that Pakistan does fail so that we can handle the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for your forthright um, analysis. That's forthright? Yeah, yeah that's forthright. It's forthright enough. Um, we're going to go to questions straight off now because we've, I, I've concluded from this, I don't know about you, that the um, conundrum in Pakistan needs to be contained and that in Afghanistan is going to become a terrorist hub again because ISIS and Al-Qaeda and everybody's going to come back. So that's a pretty grim scenario that we've concluded from this. Um, I've promised uh, three people questions. Uh, mainly because we were hanging around outside uh, a, a lot. Uh, so I'm going to give those three people questions. If you could keep it to a question and keep it short, then we'll try and get a, a, another batch in before we wrap up. Ladies first. Oh, hold on. So um, I'm Dr. Sarah Ashra from the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. I'm the manager of research and policy there. I also teach at the LSE. Um, and I've been covering this area for a while. My question is for Bashir. Bashir, one of the things I'm involved with at the moment is uh, sort of countering violent extremism. And one of the things that you mentioned, and I quite agree with it, is the need for having a DRAD program or de-radicalization program, but also reintegration program for, for returning fighters or reintegrating fighters that have been in this space, uh, particularly in Afghanistan, but you know, I would say AFPAC border areas. Um, there are people who do want to come back into the fold of society, but don't actually know how to because they've been in this space for so long. Are there any, I don't know of any, I've been looking at this for a while, are there any existing uh, de-radicalization programs in the region? And I don't just mean Afghanistan, but AFPAC because they're so interlinked. If not, how do we go about actually starting something like that? It just seems like the problem's so big. Where do we start doing that? A good question. Can we get the microphone over to this gentleman here? And then... Uh, 
uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hakim Baloch, and I'm representative of Baloch National Movement, a uh, political party struggling for the freedom of Balochistan. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Christine Fair. Uh, as China is investing in Balochistan and became crime partner of Pakistani dirty war in Balochistan, and there's also a resistance going on by the Baloch side against the Chinese expansionist design in South Asia, uh, do you not think that China's this behavior and Baloch resistance will fail CPEC and One Belt, uh, One Road? And can you also shed light on the ignorance of Western power on this important issue? Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Uh, uh, my question is with... Uh, my name is Umair Malik and I'm a diplomat working in the Pakistani embassy. Uh, my question is with Bashir Ahmed uh, Gawad. Uh, you discussed about the Taliban. And uh, you also mentioned about Khawaja Asif as well. Khawaja Asif is no more the foreign minister of Pakistan right now. Uh, he is in the opposition. So it would be more prudent to refer someone who is right now, you know, representing you the government. Him he was. He was, okay. okay. So are you referring to the Khawaja Asif as well? Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. My question is that, in your opinion, what is the present, uh, you know, uh, stature of ISIS within Afghanistan and how do you particularly di differentiate between ISIS in Afghanistan and ISIS uh, whatever it has it is in Syria or in the Levant uh, this is the question um, and the second second question is with uh, Ms. Christian Fair as well Dr. Fair, sir. sorry Dr. Fair please uh, the Dr. Fair my question is that uh, I think we, as a Pakistani, are offended when you uh, actually use those words, you know. Um, uh, excuse me, Anthony, you've had the one question, and as soon as I hear that word offense, I, okay. I take it a piece of subjective. No, no, I, I'm just going to make... have a good question, so let's, let's go on to that. Uh, Christine, can you, you answer the China-Pakistan I'm afraid, are in an unsolvable predicament. Um, I, I call CPEC uh, the China Punjabi Economic Corridor, uh, right? Because that's really where the rents are going. Mr. Gandhi, he's just not that frightening, right? 
right? So the Pakistan army can get away with this when there's a strong phone next door. And this is tied, unfortunately, to your second question is, the international community understands that there is this Balochistan problem. But the international community, particularly in a post-9-11 world, is not sympathetic to people who try to change their situation through murder. And um, the Baloch have not helped themselves by murdering Punjabis, who uh, are often called settlers. Those Punjabis are being brought to Balochistan because of the fact that you need teachers and you need police and the human capital of Baloch, for reasons which are historical, um, are simply not there, right? So when, when the Baloch pull off a, a bunch of naval men from a bus and kill them, they're not going to get any friends. When you attack a hotel at Gwadar, that's not the kind of stuff that's going to make people think the Baloch here have a problem. You, you're sent to the same problem as the Palestinians. Palestinians have a very legitimate cause. But when you use violence as the primary way of getting there, you're not going to get the sympathy that you want. Right? And so just very briefly with ISIS, ISIS in Afghanistan is no ties to al Um, In fact, it's quite curious that Pakistan officials asking this question, because many of the Islamic State activists in Afghanistan are actually rebadged members of the Pakistani Taliban. It's the Taliban Pakistan. It's not Pakistani Taliban. Sorry. Well, I'm just using the shorthand. Yes, yeah, yeah. You, know it's you must brief the audience regarding the genesis of the Taliban Pakistan as well. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I'm very happy to have that discussion. It won't work out as you think it does, yeah. sir. Um, so, <laughs> when these guys don't learn, don't put up with their misogynists, you know, happy. Just don't. So, the Afghans are actually convinced that. Islamic State is in fact the ISI. And I used to rubbish that. I used to think that that was just a bunch of nonsense. But the more time I spend in Afghanistan, it, 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 it makes less, it, it strikes me as increasingly sensible. Because what the Pakistanis are actually pretty good at is they're pretty good at writing tigers. They're not very good at dismounting from tigers. They're pretty good at getting on the tiger. And if you're the Pakistani state, you actually do want to be able to have some leverage over this prime rival to your primary proxy in parts of the country that matter. So okay, that, that's my take on uh, ISIS and Afghanistan. Mr. Bashir would be so kind. Uh, thank you. We're moving over to Bashir now to uh, perhaps corroborate or, or counter the ISIS thing, but also address the de-radicalization program issue, which I think was the first question we've heard that comes towards a solution. Yeah, radicalization programs are there in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And, uh, the Pakistan army is doing, in, for example, in Swat Valley, they have like this program, the Central Mashal and so on. Yeah. You may be aware of it. Uh, I don't know to what extent it's working because uh, they don't let uh, media to talk to these de-radicalized uh, managers. Uh, but uh, what is coming from the ICR, the military's uh, information wing, are videos and pictures that they are now like shaved and uh, uh, having uh, beautiful new clothes and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, they are also trained with the other professional activities like tailoring and other stuff that they are doing. And, uh, and there are NGOs that are working in Afghanistan and in Pakistan for really and they are running these centers as well. But nothing to an extent like Saudi is doing, and uh, you may have seen the documentary that they're, they're you know, are having a very lavish life in their hands. <laughs> if you see them, you would like to be radicalized and then be radicalizing them. So it's, it's quite a palace in there. Uh, uh, and about the ISIS, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Fair. Uh, can I talk about it? What she said, it's very, it's very true that Pakistan, the, the TTP, the Tehrik Taliban in Pakistan, uh, became uh, ISIS. Mm -hmm. Some, like uh, half of it almost, uh, became ISIS. And if you uh, know their names, most of them were killed in Afghanistan by drones and by Afghan intelligence based uh, operations. So, there is a point in here that these uh, GTP commanders were alive when they were in Pakistan. 
they were killing in the Brazilian times and trying to promote and uh, spread in the Indo region. And uh, for example, Hafiz was their commander, the commander, even though he was killed, and within a week, uh, his, uh, uh, his duty was killed in him. Uh, and uh, being from Nigra, I know that, like, I know some of the fighters uh, from, uh, I'm uh, by tribe and by ethnicity, I'm a woman. And there are fighters, Pakistanis uh, uh, they are the same tribe, but on the other side of the bar. And you may know that uh, British uh, uh, divided Afghanistan and Pakistan by different lines, so half of us are living inside Pakistan and half of us are living on the other side. My own uncles are uh, in us. So these people that you know, you, we, we know them personally. They are Pakistani Taliban and they are no part of us. So there is no uh, Arab fighters in the world. There is no, uh, like there are rumors that you know, uh, Robert Baldani is in India. I think it's rubbish because uh, if you see and I wish you could see them, they show you the methods, it's almost impossible to get somebody from you know, to all of these uh, countries Iran and then bring it to Negra from Alpine. So that, that's the ISIS. Thank you. I'm, I'm tempted to wrap it now, but uh, one question only, because you have been polite and persistent. In 30 seconds to answer it, and we're going to ask for 30 second answers from both of the panelists to wrap up. And I'm very strict on that 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. I see catering staff there, okay. and we don't want to get thrown out before the wine gets poured. All right. Uh, my name is Ahmed Turab. I'm a political commentator on South Asia. I've got a question for Dr. Fair. Uh, can PTM be a solution for Pakistan military supporting terrorism? Uh, PTM is a nonviolent uh, human rights supporter from Pashtun Hua, Manzur Pashtun. Uh, recently, the Pakistani military killed 20. PTM supporters and injured 50 PTM supporters. So can they, they be a replacement for Pakistani military terrorism in the area? My question. Okay, thank, thank you. you for, so if you could answer that, Christina, and then wrap up. So as you know, I think the PTM is the thing that scares the Fologies the most, right? Because the Fologies and their um, other partners like the Frontier Corps can kill every Baloch who resists uh, being colonized. They can't so easily do that to the Pashtuns. Pashtuns are a ruling coalition. They were coalition members with the Punjabis. Pashtuns, more so than Punjabis, are overrepresented uh, in the PMA batch every year. So the taking on the Pashtuns is a really big problem for them. And I, I think this is, again, goes back to my justification for why the Pakistanis are much more interested in having Modi in India than anyone else. So whether or not they can be an alternative, you and I both know the Pakistan fault does not want an alternative. And the PTM poses the biggest threat to the fault because the PTM figured out their roots. Going back to my comments about coalition support funds, Pashtuns figured out that they were being killed so that the Pakistanis could get the check, right? And um, we can't, we are, it's worth saying here to an audience that knows Urdu, Yejo Deshak Bardi Hai, Escape PJ Bardi Hai. I just asked uh, Bashir to wrap up for us with a 15 second solution to all these unresolved phenomena. <laughs> Okay, I think, uh, you know what, I will, I will go back to what my uh, topic was, and I think uh, if you want to solve the Afghan problem, I think there should be pressure, uh, and there is, uh, a lot of people have written about this, that there should be international and regional pressure on those who are funding the Taliban and other groups in the region. And there should be military uh, pressure on the Taliban to defending on the ground so they could agree and come to terms on the negotiation table. And I would like to mention PTM, uh, for those who don't know, Pashtun Tahafuz movement is a non-violent uh, human rights movement run by Manzur Pashtun, a guy from Waziristan. And Waziristan is very challenging in these wars. And 
they are uh, providing an alternative to these solutions because they are asking questions. And they are saying, for example, if there's a military operation, they would ask, give us the details of this operation. Uh, did you kill the real terrorists? Where are the bodies? And all these questions that nobody was asking you. And they are doing it through non-violent ways. They are protesting and they are like saying that we will never be violent. They are uh, following by Chapman's uh, philosophy, who was a friend of Gandhi, and they were non-violent. So the, they could also pressure. This could also be a solution to that problem because they could also put pressure inside Pakistan and policymakers to change their policy. We don't know to what extent it could help, but it it is one tool. Thank you. Um, so I think the conclusion is uh, one that stretches around the world, is that if you are going to solve these conflicts it's through civil society, which is what you were talking about in a very specific area uh, coming up, and in, in Barry Gardner's phrase, uh, make it more understandable to the Western community, uh, so that we don't go away not really knowing uh, the big issues that are happening there. Uh, we don't have the bandwidth to get inside this group and that group and, and, and what they believe in. I would like to, before we, we break up, just thank very much Ajit and the whole of the Democracy Forum team for laying on what was a very difficult <laughs> And for my two superb panelists and our former panelists for giving us such um, such brilliant And now finally, I thank the catering staff uh, because they're all ready to go. Thank you very much.